On March 5th of 2011, the crater floor at Puwo suddenly began to collapse. There was a lot of seismic tremor, a uh, big uh, deformation signal at Puwo. The crater floor began to collapse, producing these big clouds of, of, of dust. And we knew something was afoot. Here's a video. This is from a time lapse or from a webcam that's perched on the north rim of Puwo. So it's a little bit rainy out there. You see some flows that are active back here, and then the whole crater begins to go. And then everything shifts around because the rim on which this camera is sitting begins to fall into the crater. <laughs> Fortunately, it didn't. Um, the camera was, was okay, but a little bit creepy. But a uh, pretty impressive collapse. The whole collapse took just a couple of hours to get to its deepest portion. So why did the crater collapse? Well, that's because magma began to break its way from the conduit beneath Pu the conduit in between Puwo and the summit. That conduit carrying magma ruptured. Magma began to push its way toward the surface. This depressurized the magma body beneath Puwo, allowing it to drain. And the crater floor just simply rode that magma body down as it emptied. And within a few hours, a few hours later, uh, just after 5 p.m., uh, the, the magma reached the surface and began erupting as this fissure eruption. Uh, this is just to the east of Pu'uo'o. And we call this the Kamoamoa fissure eruption. I was actually on the ground. I was flying over the volcano when it started because we knew something was going to happen and we was able to land and get on the ground. And, and uh, it was pretty cool because um, one of the things that we've seen in the past and with this eruption as well is that as the as the dike, as the lava is opening, moving, the crack is opening, you get this heavy fuming from the crack. And then as soon as the lava appears, that fume disappears and it turns into this bluish color. Now these two photos from the same spot were taken a minute apart. And just point out the, uh, the, how wide the crack is here compared to the way it was a minute before. So these cracks were actually visibly opening and we could see them opening from the air when we were flying over. And then actually when I was standing here taking these photos, you could feel the ground beneath my feet widening because I was actually standing on both sides of the crack. Because that would, would have, well, it was a good view down the line of the fissures. I wasn't, I wasn't that close, you know. So this is a movie I took um, a few minutes later um, from the side showing the, the front of the, from the front of this, um, we call it dike. It's the, the magma body that's rising up through the cracks and approaching the surface. This is just uh, perhaps only a minute after this lava has reached the surface. And this is really small. I mean, this is maybe five feet from the ground up the top here. And you get a sense of you know, how weak this activity is when it starts. So just you know, little bubbles that are just bursting through the stagnant, uh, nearly stagnant lava surface. Um, really weak activity. You can see in the background here, it's a little bit hard with this, but there's you know, the lava is you know, kind of oozing out of the crack and forming these flows which extend downhill away from the crack, from the, uh, from the fissure as we call it. The eruption continued overnight and by the next morning a new fissure had opened. This is a series of fissures farther to the west. Uh, about a half a mile or so from where the, the previous um, video was taken. This is closer to the Nepal Crater. The Nepal Crater is just out of sight up here at the top. And this, as the, um, as the eruption progressed, it began to increase in intensity. And those of you in front might, might be able to uh, pick this out, but there's a little white spot right in here. That's the upper torso of one of my colleagues. So it gives you a sense of scale. These are, you know, full-size, 30 to 40 foot high trees. So activity's picked up greatly by this time compared to what it was when the fissure first opened. You can also see that in, in views like this. Um, this is very close to where I took the, the earlier video. We have, you know, pretty vigorous spattering forming this nice uh, spatter rampart, spatter cone. So activity was increasing as the eruption progressed. Here's a video of the, um, the previous slide. This is a video of that same, um, the same part of the fissure. And it, you know, it's pretty, pretty obvious this is, this is bigger activity. 
And this is probably about 15 feet high right here. So we're looking at stuff that's, you know, the tops of the uh, opaque part are probably opaque part of the fallons are reaching maybe 30 feet or so with stuff going up perhaps two or three times that high, small particles. So there's a really cool bubble that happens right in here somewhere. There it is. Boom. That's a huge bubble. Um, yeah, this is cool stuff. Um, so the eruption, uh, this is a nice overview photo. Um, this is from March 8th, so this would be March about the third full day of the eruption. And you can see that there's an eastern line of fissures. This is what opened up first. The fissure actually opened up. Uh, my first video where the activity was weak was right in here. That previous video was from this right here. So the fissure opened up, extended toward the east as it, as it advanced, and then activity focused near the eastern end of that fissure. The western fissure started in the middle and then extended in both directions. And by this day, on the 8th of March, the activity had actually focused at the western end of this western group of fissures. And this was actually the most vigorous part of the entire eruption from this western part of the fissures. And it began feeding a channelized flow which extended down slope. A bit hard to see, there's a, a, the edge of a channel is visible right in here. And you know, this is fume here, but this, dark, this uh, thicker white is smoke where the uh, flow is entering the forest. Here's a view back here looking back toward this channel on the next day. Uh, here you can see this nice channelized flow. This is a thermal image overlaid on top of a regular photograph. You can see, um, just to show off the heat, here you can see the channel coming down and then it's feeding into this uh, nice uh -huh flow which has uh, reconnected with the older Puo flow field. So to give you a, a view of what those fountains looked like during this most vigorous part. And you can see that uh, these are going about the same height as the previous video I showed, but you can just get a sense that this is, there's a lot more volume here. There's a lot more um, lava coming out of this crack. It's actually feeding a big lava pond here, which then feeds in downslope into this perch channel, or, or into this uh, channelized flow. And this activity went on for two full days. And then we thought things were going to keep on going, and suddenly in the evening on March 9th, activity just waned away over a period of about an hour, and the eruption stopped. So this eruption lasted from the evening on March 4th to the evening on March 9th. 